Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Son Inju, a professor and a deputy director, Institute for Future Strategy at Seoul National University. Uh, thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, I'm very delighted to uh, moderate this first panel discussions. Uh, our speakers will speak uh, in person to audience here, and also we web uh, <coughs> we, uh, we cast live to the audience around the world. Uh, this forum comes at an important moment. Uh, there is growing international awareness of the significance of the intense uh, technology competition between United States and China and its implication for evolving uh, world order, uh, including the uh, global supply chain. Our uh, panelists will provide a deep understanding uh, about US-China technological competition and a restructuring of global supply chain that has emerged in the past few years. It's a stunning in scope and uh, speed. And there are also heated uh, debates over uh, Republic of Korea's position and response to these new global dynamics. To discuss this topic, uh, we have an outstanding panel today. Uh, we have uh, three back-to-back uh, uh, -back presentations. Uh, each speaker is supposed to give about 20 minutes uh, talk. Uh, followed by the uh, comments and remarks by the, our designated discussant. Then I will moderate uh, the question and answer with the audience. Uh, Two-way simultaneous interpretation uh, is available at this forum uh, all day long, as I understand it. So feel, uh, pre, uh, feel free to speak Hangugo or English. So now let me uh, please introduce our speakers and discussant. Uh, First of all, our first speaker, William Bombillan, is a senior director at the Office of Digital Learning of Massachusetts Institute for Technology. He is one of the leading influential figures in the U.S. in this field. Uh, his book, new book, uh, Workforce Education New Roadmap, was released uh, last year uh, by MIT Press. Uh, on top of that, he is the author of uh, four uh, prominent books on innovation policy. And uh, he also this, uh, uh, took a lot of various leadership positions, including serving on National Academies of Science Board on Materials and Manufacturing, and is a standing committee for its Innovation Policy Forum, and also serving uh, NS committee, chaired the Committee on Science Engineering Policy at the American Association for Advancement Science for four years. Uh, next speaker, second speaker is uh, uh, Dr. Che Byung-il, uh, president of Korea Foundation for Advanced Studies and also professor of Graduate School of International Studies, Ihua Women University. Uh, Dr. Che is a distinguished scholar in the field of international trade and U.S.-China relations. He took uh, various leadership roles, including uh, president of Korea Economic Research Institute, and also think tank, uh, is a think tank rep, uh, representing Korean business sector. He also served as a president, president for Korea International Economic Association and the uh, president of Korea Association for Trade Industry uh, Studies. Prior to joining academia, he was a Korean chief negotiator for the WTO Basic Telecommunications. Uh, uh, next speaker is uh, Jung Dae-jin, Deputy uh, Minister for Trade at the Minister of Trade, and Industry, and uh, Energy. He is uh, in charge of uh, Korean ROK policy during this field. Uh, he served at the Minister of Trade, Industry, and Energy at the, as a Director General for Industry, responsible for enhancing industrial competitiveness, and also Director General for uh, Investment, supporting domestic foreign investment, uh, also, he's in charge of uh, implementing trade policies. He's, uh, he received his MA degree and Bachelor degree in economics from Seoul National University. Our third uh, the speaker, <coughs> oh, no, no, uh, Jung De uh, our uh, designated discussant is Jung Chul, uh, Dr. Jung Chul, a senior research fellow at Korea Institute for International Economic Policy and also vice chair of the Korean National Committee for Pacific Economic Cooperations. He has served as a senior vice president at Kiev until uh, year 2020. In the government, Dr. Chung has served as a member of a presidential commission on policy planning of Republic of Korea, 
and senior trade advisor to Minister of Trade, Industry, Energy, as well as a member of a long-term strategy committee chaired by Deputy Prime Minister. And uh, he, Dr. Chung also worked with the Korea Embassy in the United States and U.S. Chamber of Commerce on ratification of Korea-U.S. FTA as a chief economist of the Korea International Trade Association. So without further ado, uh, I'd like to turn it over to uh, the, our first speaker, William Bon Williams. Please go ahead. Please. Let me first thank the sponsors of this conference. I'm privileged to be here and greatly appreciate the invitation to share thinking and ideas with you today. Uh, I want to discuss kind of emerging U.S. policies uh, on what I'd like to call industrial innovation policy and perhaps give some sense, I think, of where these issues now stand uh, in the United States because a great deal, as you all know, has been evolving. Uh, so let me give a brief context here. Um, in 1945, at the end of the Second World War, in the post-war period, the U.S. really organized its governmental support system for innovation around a basic research stage. So in 1945, the United States uh, was indeed the world manufacturing leader. It didn't have to think about manufacturing. Its capacity was very deep, but it was still catching up on basic research. Coming into World War II, countries like Germany or Britain um, had significantly stronger basic research systems. That's something which began to get built in the course of the war, um, but needed expansion. So in 1945, the government reached a conclusion that the governmental role was to support basic research, filling in a gap um, in the U.S. innovation system. And we evolved, I think as many of you are, are familiar with, we evolved kind of a pipeline theory of technology development. We separated science out. The governmental role was to support science, um, and industry would pick up the following, the follow-on stages. So science, indeed, was kind of a, treated as a separate actor with governmental support, um, and we moved from a much more integrated model in the course of the war to a really disaggregated model in the post-war period. So, this model put together by one of our science leaders at the time, Vannevar Bush, really, institute, it really institutionalized what we could call the valley of death, the gap between basic research and applied research. And in the US, there's comparatively few bridging mechanisms between the two sides. Uh, and let me turn to, I think, a major driver um, that's underlying a lot of current U.S. policy, which is the U.S. manufacturing decline, which has really been ongoing since about 1970. Um, as I said before, after World War II, the U.S. was a world manufacturing leader. Uh, then it focused its innovation system on R&D. It did not focus it on manufacturing. That was not the problem. That was not the gap. The U.S. developed research-led innovation in this pipeline model that I referred to earlier. Other countries, Germany, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, China, developed manufacturing-led innovation. The U.S. has not done that. Uh, so the United States lost one-third of its manufacturing jobs and shut down 60,000 factories between 2000 and 2020. Uh, and as everyone in this room understands, the U.S. and China have, in effect, traded manufacturing places. So China produced almost 30 percent of world manufacturing output in 2019, pre-COVID, while the U.S. produced some 16 percent, which is a reversal of the numbers a couple of decades earlier. Manufacturing decline created really major social disruption in the United States. So we have an increasing problem with e economic inequality in the U.S., as opposed to its long history of economic convergence. That's a festering problem in the U.S. for the last 15 years. So my colleague at MIT, David Otter, uh, 
has a barbell symbol for what's been going on in U.S. society. So in this barbell, in the left bell, there's a growing, very successful, more successful than ever, upper middle class. The middle class itself has been thinning out. And a significant part of that middle class has been pushed into the other bell, a growing lower end services sector, right? Uh, with much less secure jobs, with, with much lower wage base. Uh, that has led to deep societal disruption in the United States. Obviously, the U.S. has got famous, a whole generation of famous IT-related companies, Google, Apple, others. But those firms have created, generally speaking, comparatively limited employment in the United States. This is a, a picture of this evolving economic inequality in the United States. So you see the long history of convergence, which stretched past the, the post-war era and really stretches well before that. Uh, but you can see, starting in the 1980s, really, a real divide between working class compensation and the status of the upper middle class. You can see that split. And that's been driving this whole problem of economic disruption that's been driving the growing antipathy between our political parties. Um, Donald Trump understood this divide. He essentially created a new political party around that stagnating incomes in the working class. Um, he was able to obtain substantial control over an historic Republican party that was devoted to free trade, which has now completely reversed its policies along those lines. So this manufacturing decline has had profound social ramifications in the US. It's driving a period of real political disruption in the United States. So what's evolved since this decline? So the US has looked, and this really regards industrial policy kinds of issues, the US has looked um, at various models reaching further down the innovation pipeline to make the connections between R&D and implementation how far down the innovation pipeline should the US federal government's role go? Uh, and we have two universes here. We have a universe that's led by our traditional strong science agencies, the National Science Foundation, the Office of Science, the Department of Energy, the National Institutes of Health, and various other organizations. They support, as this pipeline demonstrates, research and early stage development. Our Defense Department has a much more connected system and supports research and development, but for defense-related technologies, will also support prototyping, demonstration, test bed, production, market stages. So in effect, the United States is running two innovation systems here in parallel, one for the non-defense economy and one for, obviously, the much smaller defense economy. So we've had five periods historically where the U.S. has attempted to better connect the two sides um, of that valley of death, the, the science and, te and technology development, technology implementation sides. I've talked about that first period, the post-war period, where we moved from a wartime connected economy to a more disconnected set of connections. Um, a second period was around the Sputnik period, 1957, 1958. Uh, where we attempted to, on the defense side in particular, better connect the two sides of that valley of death. Um, and that's when DARPA was created. That's when NASA, the Space Administration, was created. Those new agencies, which were much more connected, uh, came along as a result of this need. A third period was in the 1980s, a competitiveness period over manufacturing, particularly with Japan, but also with Germany to some extent a whole series of new, more connected federal programs of small size came about in that period. Really in the 2000, uh, mid-2000, uh, 2010 kind of period, a fourth era was around the growing climate and energy challenge. And during this period, we created a whole series of new entities in our Department of Energy to try and cope with the climate crisis, the need for, need for new energy technologies, I've listed some of these here. Um, a fifth period, we'll see, 
uh, was, came around the recognition of, that the U.S. has got a deep problem with implementing advanced manufacturing. Uh, U.S. launched 16 manufacturing institutes. Pending legislation will probably create several more. Of course, as my Fraunhofer colleagues understand, um, we bought a lot of their ideas and put this program together. But it began to be a focus on the innovation side of manufacturing. So those are past policies. Um, and we need to define industrial policy. And I just wanted to define it very simply uh, and make a distinction here. But industrial innovation policy, we can define in terms of those well-known stages that a technology must advance through. That pipeline list I discussed before from research and development to prototyping to testing, demonstration, and, and actual product development, um, financing, market entry, market creation, all those follow-on stages. Industrial innovation policy will mean the government moving beyond simply the research stage into those later stages. And as I suggested earlier, historically, the U.S. has not done that on its non-defense side. Uh, so the U.S. has had a long history of industrial economic policy, where obviously numerous countries do the same thing, um, a series of supports for various sectors in, uh, in the economy, including in agriculture through things like price controls or government-supported irrigation systems, uh, in energy for things like um, hydropower, fossil fuel supports, renewable supports, uh, in health, through Medicare, obviously in transport infrastructure. Um, these are traditional uh, governmental interventions into kind of economic, po economic policy elements. In other words, they're supporting existing product lines, existing technologies. But industrial innovation policy, I would argue, really focuses on, on that innovation side itself. Uh, and as I've defined it, it is a governmental intervention into the, the post-research kinds of stages. There are three new drivers in the U.S. driving these policies, and everyone in the room I know is familiar with these. A technology competition with China, climate change, um, and the pandemic. Um, but there are barriers here to these new, more interventionist policies in the U.S., uh, particularly the way in which we have organized our government support for R&D in the past has not extended beyond that research and early, early stage development phase. So that's a real barrier towards implementing a new round of industrial innovation policies. And of course, there's a new geopolitical driver. We're moving towards a new international system, which will be the discussion here today. It obviously has great consequences uh, for innovation policy. I, I, to a significant extent, a deglobalization is underway, I think driven initially uh, by a recognition of the demands of coping with the COVID pandemic. Uh, but older ideas on organizing industry, things like just-in-time inventory and core competency, um, I think are being replaced by newer ideas around resiliency and more vertically integrated firms. And we're now in, in another period where democratic governments appear to be challenged by autocratic governments. It's an unstable situation. There are six major new U.S. policies that have developed between 2020 and 2022. And I'd like to, that mark a dramatic sea change, an advent really of new industrial innovation policies in the U.S. The first of these we called uh, Operation Warp Speed. It was the effort to rapidly develop and deploy vaccines. Uh, perhaps the most important of these six different elements, dramatic governmental intervention to rapidly develop uh, and deploy vaccines. The CHIPS Act, which many of you are familiar with, was an attempt to uh, restore, to the extent possible, some U.S. semiconductor leadership, uh, U.S. output of semiconductor chips into the global economy its production has now fallen to a 12% level. Um, it was in the 36% range, you know, a decade before. So a deep concern 
uh, on the national security side in particular. A major infrastructure bill passed in 2021. Uh, it created a lot of traditional transportation infrastructure, but also a whole new kind of infrastructure for energy technologies, for carbon capture and sequestration, hydrogen, advanced nuclear, critical minerals, renewables. Uh, that was a $20 billion effort that is fully funded, and a whole new program has been created within our Department of Energy, a technology demonstration office to demonstrate and implement these technologies. There's been an effort in the White House, really led by the pandemic problems that the U.S. ran into on pharmaceuticals and, and uh, pharmaceutical ingredients. Uh, but the White House has a plan really looking at supply chains and their strength around the pharmaceutical issues, around advanced batteries, around critical minerals, and around semiconductors. Uh, and that includes both assistance on financing, as well as supply chain rebuilding. The Inflation Reduction Act of 2022, which many in this room are familiar with, was the first really large-scale effort by the United States to deal with climate change. And this has funded $375 billion uh, for new energy and climate technology challenges. It's not simply research. There's a lot of support for applied technology. And finally, and I'll talk about this in a minute, uh, legislation that's called the Chips and Science Act. I mentioned the Chips Act, but the science part I'll focus on in a minute, uh, that authorized a whole new round of applied science programs. So let me do quick uh, several case studies. Operation Warp Speed. In this case, the federal government picked a series of companies in four different vaccine technology areas and supported those companies by guaranteed contracts that enabled them to undertake production well before their vaccines were actually approved by our uh, federal drug agency, uh, the emergency use approval system. So this is picking winners. It's a top-down kind of approach. Uh, electric vehicles, another case study. Uh, you know, we all think that Tesla is the creation of this of Elon Musk, and uh, but the story is more complex. Uh, the government wanted to implement electric vehicles. It created a network of supporting um, incentive programs that were both at the federal level and at the state level, uh, and that led to, frankly, major support for Tesla's evolution, which it took full advantage of. Any firm could have picked up these different incentive pieces, but Tesla was mobilized and organized to do so. And it's been key at many stages to Tesla's evolution, including saving it from bankruptcy uh, in the post-2009 period. So these are two different models that the US is exploring for industrial innovation policy. This top-down model, such as through Operation Warp Speed, and this bottom-up approach, setting out a menu of incentives that firms could potentially take advantage of. A third case study is on this Chips and Science Act. I'll just summarize it very briefly, but the concern here is that US technology history was littered with technologies that were innovated in the United States that did not scale up in the United States uh, and got produced abroad with, obviously, some of the economic consequences I discussed earlier. Uh, the legislation identifies 10 critical technology areas uh, for R&D, but really applied focus at the bastion of U.S. basic science, uh, the, our National Science Foundation. So it's adding a whole applied technology wing to our traditional basic research agency. There are gaps in these six initiatives. Scale-up financing is a major gap. We haven't really addressed the funding, the financing of the scale-up process. Uh, we haven't adequately addressed support for the manufacturing stage. Unless these technologies can be manufactured, they're not going to be implemented. And then there's a big issue of cross-agency collaboration in the US. We have independent, a plethora of independent R&D organizations organized around particular missions. A lot of these agencies are going to have to collaborate if these technologies are going to be moved. 
So is the US entering a new era of industrial innovation policy? Um, I, think it's, I think this has begun. There has been bipartisan support for virtually all of these initiatives. It's gonna require completely new thinking and, and skills by our traditional US science base at the agencies that are gonna be required to implement it. They're gonna to have to learn these new systems from science, not just science research, but understanding the production side. So for these programs to work, which are large scale, we're gonna need a new infrastructure for industrial innovation policy. We're gonna need change agents that have the skill sets to be able to lead these efforts. We're gonna need connections across these research institutions. We're gonna to need to rebuild US manufacturing foundations uh, we're going to need to understand the whole mapping process for supply chain and how to fill supply chain gaps better than we do. We're going to need test technology testing and demonstration, um, a whole new effort at how do you accelerate technology introduction through technology certification. We're going to need flexible contracting mechanisms. Uh, we need to apply government procurement programs to acquire the output of some of these technologies, at least some of them. Um, and we're going to need particularly this technology scale-up financing, which remains a gap. So there are underlying issues here that this conference will be focused on. U.S. national security is deeply tied to rebuilding U.S. manufacturing. Um, technology leadership drives national security leadership, and manufacturing is the crossroads between national security and economic security. The three are very, very interdependent, and that's really I think being perceived now, finally, in the United States. Obviously, there's great controversy here in Korea over a $7,500 buyer credit for electric vehicles uh, that passed in the recent Inflation Reduction Act that passed in August. The EU and Korea are looking at that as GATT violative. There's practical questions in that legislation itself that are being asked in the U.S. The U.S. automotive sector has argued that that credit is not available to 70% of the electric vehicles now in the US market, and 40% don't meet the battery sourcing requirement. So the, the practical foundations of this legislation are, uh, are somewhat problematic. But in a larger sense, um, US manufacturing and US technology development is not large enough for the US to go this alone. Um, I don't think this realization is widespread at this point in the United States, but I think it will come to this. Um, the U.S. is going to have to adopt what I think we could call a strategic orientation to this technology sovereignty issue that is going to require it to be more engaged and more independent with, with clusters of other nations. Um, so I think this conference is particularly timely in raising those issues. Thank you. Can I see my PowerPoint? Okay, yeah. Well, uh, thank you very much. Again, it's my extreme pleasure uh, to be able to share my perspective, which I call Korean perspective, in the midst of intensifying US-China uh, competition in tech hegemony. Well, let me start with by showing uh, these pictures, uh, which was showing uh, late June, I guess, in NATO summit, uh, there was a lot of uh, attention, of course, naturally given to the, what's going on in Ukraine. And it looks like this scene is, uh, you see on the top right, is very common, you know, scene. So Zelensky wearing uh, T-shirts and making speech. This may be last time you wanna see me live. So <clears throat> that's sort of in historic turnaround. And but what was happening at Madrid was uh, four uh, so-called Asian Pacific countries were invited to NATO, which has originally nothing to do with Asia Pacific. And the important thing is the uh, Korean new government is finding its place in NATO summit. And at the end of the conference summit, they concluded 
adopted so-called strategic concept, and for the first time NATO, they identified China as complex uh, challenge. And that is a natural introduction to intensifying U.S.-China competition. And of course, this is Act 2. Act 1 is opened by Donald Trump versus Xi Jinping. Act 2 is uh, between uh, Biden and uh, Xi Jinping. And Biden, from his day one, he ordered to re reconfigure uh, global supply chain of some critical uh, product. So that is related to conference we are taking today. Uh, how to attain uh, technological sovereignty in key sectors. The key sector uh, I then, uh, Biden government identified was uh, four product, semiconductor, electric vehicle battery, and important key material including rare element and bioproduct. Within 100 days, the government, Biden administration, come up with solutions. Solution is, as my pretty, uh, previous uh, speakers, uh, Mr. Bon Billion, uh, he mentioned so-called industrial innovation policy. So as an economist, we spent early days by criticizing industrial policy, how bad, how it is going to hamper efficiency. But now here we are. And it's quite natural if you are at White House, if you're looking at commanding height, who is controlling commanding height? Obviously, it's not US, it's some other country. So they want to regain uh, commanding height. And also, <clears throat> four years ago, three years ago, uh, Director of National Intelligence, Daniel Coase, as he presented his view on Senate Intelligence Committee, uh, his view was uh, someone on this one simple uh, graph, which is showing gap between US and China in uh, technical sensitive industrial sectors, excepting aircraft is closing in. So it is naturally causing concern. I think this is a second so-called Sputnik moment. And ever since, no matter who is in the White House, whether it is a Republican or a Democrat, I think they're all eyeing on China. So China, according to US administration, and technological expert is the uh, biggest ideological geopolitical threat facing the US, and, and which means what is happening in front of our eyes is not likely to be reversed. So we are deep into new era, and all the days where China, Chinese speakers uh, in this forum, actually a lot of Chinese speakers came to KFES and spoke in front of uh, Korean students and global leaders where rising of China is good for you. We are a communist country, but we are seeking peaceful rise. And Washington believed, and the place in China global trading system will secure their transition toward the so-called right path. But all uh, that is now in basket case. And it is mainly because, unlike to many belief, unlike to many view of uh, scientists and scholars, looks like a party is controlling technology. We thought it is going to be private sector. They are a driver's seat, who will decide, who will dictate future of technology. But in case of China, it looks like a party. And you know, the, a lot of you, you've been to China, and I think you had uh, sharing common experience like me. If you lost your passport, within a few hours, they will get a secure passport. It is because they are deep learning, AIs, and, and so on and so forth. So they call a new word that is a digital Leninism, and they are exporting and spreading to all of the universe. And that means if technology is going to be available by all of us, that is going to lead more you know, liberal society, more peaceful country, but we are living very different opposite of this, uh, this utopia. And as it turns out, competition between US and China, especially technology, is uh, not just one year old, it's uh, you know, some years old, ever since the first year of Donald Trump administration adopted so-called national security strategy, they clearly identified uh, rise of China is uh, threatening security of US and security of US economic life. And all these alarm barriers are ringing wide. And the case of highway is a very devastating case. If US determined it has capacity and intention to go all the way to break a company. 
So Huawei, downfall, rise and downfall of Huawei is a very, very interesting case. So that means in some key technology sectors where U.S. is uh, still taking the commanding height in terms of uh, designs and R&D, uh, for instance, semiconductor, I think you know, it is still the game is in favor of USA. But on the other hand, something like electric vehicle battery, I think game is rather different. So whether or not US can be very successful in reconfiguring global supply chain to their favor is open-ended question. I'd like to put that to, to the discussions amongst us. So what is happening, especially since the outbreak of pandemic, uh, country after country, they were given a lot of time to figure out how we can uh, decrease reliance on so-called untrustworthy partner. So reshoring, uh, near shoring, friend shoring, ally shoring, all sort of shoring. And but U.S. is pursuing reshoring into soil of U.S. But their problem is they cannot do by their own companies. It is mainly because, as my previous speakers mentioned, U.S. is a lacking manufacturing power base and the base to scale up, even though they maintain and they occupy the early stage of all this production cycle, like R&D innovation, but somehow scale up is a very different story. So because of it, they tend to rely on so-called like-minded and value-sharing democratic countries and that's where Korea is finding ourselves. So when Biden was visiting Korea this spring, his first visit was a semiconductor factory in Korea, Samsung Electronics. And also uh, when the chairman of uh, SK, when he was visiting uh, Washington and making huge pledge, we'll increase our bet on electric vehicle battery in the USA. Uh, Biden couldn't attend meeting, but he was greeting and he was wholeheartedly. But as it turns out, it is quite risky. So that is I call American risk because while US is interested in securing Korea sport, Taiwan sport, and Japanese sport, and European sport, but the politicians, they are mindfully aiming re-elections and their mindset is only two, two, two years ahead. And so it looks like you know, the between administration and uh, politics, I don't see any effective coordinations. That I call American risk, that is risk of populism under democratic regime. So which means a country like Korea, uh, even if Korea is, uh, happened to uh, occupy some key chain of production, but we are facing two insurmountable risk. One is China risk, which has been out there for a long time, and we know how it is, and but businessmen, they ignore China risk still these days, and now they're facing American risk. So that is putting Korea in new different challenge. So it's quite obvious we're into new world. The old world, old normal, it is fading away. Is, uh, there was a huge firewall between trade and security. So which means uh, even if uh, you have some uh, country under different political regime, you could trade, you could invest, and you could exchange, but that days are gone. It is because underlying presumption has been fundamentally shaken. Underlying presumption is a peaceful rise of China and engagement and cooperation with China is going to put China the right path. That right path is uh, from Washington's point of view and Western's point of view, China will converge to, even though it is going to be very slow, but eventually at the end of the day, history is going to be China is transforming from one party to plural party and from authoritarian democracy, as they call, but less demeaning and soft authoritarianism, maybe eventually some, some element of democracy, as you can evidence in Singapore. So that has the peaceful transition of China in the mindset of Westerners. And also they were thinking at the end of the day, China is going to see more prospering private sector driving seat, government is going to take a back seat, and as it turns out, there has been a golden recipe, which is so China's 30 years in you know, hyper economic growth. And but somehow it looks like China is uh, taking a U-turn and reversing turn. 
and ever since emergence of you know, Xi Jinping. So all the normal uh, was basically uh, through the 30 decades of hyperinflation, we were witnessing seamless global value chain. The one single example is uh, Apple smartphone in Xinjiang. It is designed in California, but assembled in China. But on the current system, you cannot imagine Steve Jobs is uh, taking all this production scale in Xinjiang and, and you know, rely on Chinese uh, government mercy. It is unthinkable. But the mantra at those time was just in time and cost efficiency. And looks like we are rapidly, suddenly moving into new emerging uh, new normal. That is obviously firewall between trade and security was uh, fading away, especially so-called key sectors. I think government and policymakers are de deciding, discussing what is going to be key sectors, uh, whether or not it is going to be narrow net or it is going to be wide net. That is something we need to discuss. And also as a result, the key words and the most single dominant you know, buzzword these days is uh, global value chain. Obviously, even you know, four years ago, five years ago, no one cares about global value chain because the global value chain is well and functioning. But it looks like you know, that they are not interested in just in time. They are more interested in just in case. And politicians and also businessmen, they're interested in securing control and securing resilience, ensuring uh, you know, the stability. So because of that, we are on the verge of witnessing for the first time in past three decades, emergence of two possible different regional value chains, so to speak, in some key sectors. I think the first is definitely semiconductor, and second one is biochemical sectors, and third one is maybe in key raw materials. And electric vehicle, I have no confidence. I do not know whether or not it is going to be successful. So which means we're going to, uh, we're going to have less efficient value chain, but it looks like that's inevitable. And China has its own game plan. China tried to react by transforming its economy from world factory to world sectors. They rely on its G2 level economic size, and that uh, is going to provide China some cushions and so China wants to create China's version of so-called, you know, the domestic market-driven value chain. Whether or not it is going to be successful is open-ended question. But one thing I can tell you is uh, China will come up with its own version of value chain. Uh, of course, it is not going to be effective. It is going to be low quality. But, you know, in this increasing divided world, in some key sectors, uh, technology, and that uh, is going to ensure Communist Party will be in control, is going to get them moving for some decades alone. And at the same time, China has game plan, so-called, which I call divide and rule, because I think a European country was their target, and they, had, they spent uh, a lot of resources in uh, coming to European countries and creating so-called 16 plus one partnership under which a lot of Central Eastern European country was having some economic ties with Chinese countries, and then they were welcoming Chinese investment. That is uh, about to be a uh, thing of past because of all this attitude shown by Chinese government and Chinese diplomat after outbreak of pandemic and increasing uh, the power competition, also what is happening in Hong Kong democracy movement. Also, there was historic trade agreement between European Union and China, which they call a conference agreement on investment, just on the eve of official declaration of pandemic. That was announced December 30th, 2020. And by achieving it, Beijing was firmly believed, even if U.S. is pushing us to the corners, but we can divide and rule and we can secure our breathing room. But I think, you know, the CAI was uh, now uh, almost almost virtually dead in uh, Brussels and Strasbourg. I do not know, but you know, the, my European colleague, uh, you can uh, provide your own thought. But even if you know, this is a very uh, headwind against China's uh, moving forward, I think they have two very important, their own arsenals, weapons. Well, let me ask you these questions. 
Suppose international standard is going to be decided not by quality, not by market dominance, but by making one country is making one vote. Suppose you have 200 countries in this world. Then between US or Western standard and China standard, which standard will be accepted? Anyone who believe Western American standard is accepted by this UN National Solar Assembly? Raise your hands. I see one, two, three. Okay. Anyone who believe Chinese version is going to be adopted and something like UN National Assembly? Uh, only purposely, <laughs> which means a lot of people, they decide to not to vote. You see, this is, uh, this is the current state of thinking. That means no one is at a uh, you know, controlling stage. And so-called bystand, bystanders and third parties, they are folding their arms and to see what's going on. And about two years ago, when I was opening this question, I was seeing so many hands arising to China's faith. Okay, so that is what we are living in. And I think at this point should be vividly cleared and conveyed to policymakers in Washington and policymakers in Brussels so, so that they can realize realities. I think that's benefit of holding this sort of conference in Korea. Well, this is showing how China is facing, you know, the headwinds. So all this favorable opinion which they helped to cultivate for a decade is now gone because the act, not worse, they have shown. But still question remain because as evidenced by my some, you know, uh, previous exercise, whether or not US can lead is subject to suspicion, if I use very harsh word, or subject to very open-ended questions if I use my word, because what they try to achieve on international arena is unlikely to be sustainable to many, and life cycle maybe two years, four years, six years, then what's going to happen after that? And can they, I mean, a new incoming administration in the US, they have enough consensus within US to move on? And even though consensus is, uh, you know, anything about uh, China, that is open-ended question. It is mainly because too many people in this corner world, they have perceptions, despite all these, you know, good words, but actions speak loud and worse. That's what I learned from, you know, the whole English conversation practice. So what is happening is, as evidenced by Inflation Reduction Act, despite their lack of production scaling up capacity, but they come up with that ridiculous, you know, the regulations. Only product manufacturers, America, including some vicinity, is going to be eligible. And that is far from realities. But that has happened because they are conscious of elections. And old action is uh, speaking loud to domestic constituency. Well, it is not new. It has been U.S. from the beginning all the time. But all early days, I'm going to argue, let's say 1960, 1970, that was, you know, the U.S. was holding commanding height. But now in this era, where party and technology are deeply connected, and then there is questions whether or not uh, U.S. can effectively, successfully overcome domestic political constraint. So let me conclude by saying we are witnessing reconfiguration of two Silicon Valley. And some years ago, there were two Silicon Valleys uh, competing and collaborating. One Silicon Valley is uh, based in San Francisco Bay, uh, my second home. <laughs> I from the Berkeley and Stanford. And, but beauty and the reason why we have own Silicon Valley or even two Silicon Valley in the world is mainly because the attraction is offering. Mainly because anyone can dream about going from zero to one. But the problem is because of many regulation in the USA, including human rights, they have difficulty of commercially 
making it to test bed. That test bed at massive scale and speed of light is happening in ancient Silicon Valley, Shenzhen. So as a result, we see it is not a US company, it is not a Korean company, which is a controlling commercial drone. Take just one example. But even in the case, before outbreak of intensifying US-China power competition technical hegemony, they were in collaborating competition. Once they recognized where well, this can be readily commercialized, then there was competition begin to aim for consumers' wallet. But now we see these days, China cannot come to Silicon Valley or European landscape for the purpose to buy and acquire new companies. So this transaction is almost blocked. And also, American mines or Western investors has difficulty of coming to China and try to secure their production base. So we're increasingly seeing demarcations between two Silicon Valley. So that means the future is unlike the past we've been witnessing, less efficient but more concerned, I'm going to say more obsessed with controlling and welcome to world of sovereignty, technology sovereignty. Thank you very much, I will stop here. Thank you very much for the um, very informative insightful uh, presentation and the uh, so provoking ideas. Now it's turn to the our designated uh, discussion, Dr. Chong Chol. Okay, um, um, thank you for uh, inviting me to this uh, international forum. And uh, I can't agree more with the, uh, the uh, three prominent speakers uh, who gave us the uh, fabulous uh, presentations. So it's a tough task for me to, uh, you know, discuss all the aspects of these uh, presentations, uh, but I'll give it a try. And the, the I'd like to first uh, sh sh share a, uh, a few slides with you. Can you? Okay. So next page, please. So uh, um, in this session, the, the we are talking about the, the maybe some causes and the, the effects of the the. Uh, U.S.-China uh, competitive uh, strategy competition, and I think this is one of the most important, uh, you know, graph that shows the uh, the uh, declining the uh, the U.S. manufacturing jobs, and the uh, the rising the uh, the Chinese, uh, you know, the uh, the uh, uh, products penetration into the uh, the U.S. market. Next. Yeah, I have only a couple more, so. <laughs> and then the other, you can see the other statistics from the other, you know, the global M&A, and especially the Chinese M&A um, before the other 2017 and after the year 2017, how the uh, dramatically changed. And, um, you know, global F FDI downturn since the year 2016 and especially Chinese investment into the US and EU dropped, I mean, plummeted, basically. And it is the, uh, the you know, uh, the sort of the, uh, the beginning of the, uh, this, uh, you know, US-China uh, strategy competition. So, um, according to the, uh, the Bill's presentation today, I think it's brilliant to divide this uh, industrial policy into the, uh, the economic, and the, uh, the innovation. Uh, I think that's very, very uh, nice. So to me, it's like the, uh, the, the mechanism is similar. It's like the other uh, picking winners. And the other, uh, but emphasis is different because the other uh, innovation puts more emphasis on the uh, the whole package, the manufacturing and the other, uh, you know, in more domestic market oriented. But my question is, is it sustainable? Um, and the, uh, the he uh, he brought us the uh, the, the example, the case study of the uh, the uh, operation warp uh, speed. So it's it's possible because it's like an emergency. 
but you cannot run a hospital only with the other emergency, you know, the other room. And there's going to be a fatigue. It cannot be a long-term, you know, solution. So right now, I, I understand the, the U.S. is going that path and uh, that kind of the, the industrial policy uh, aiming for the, the innovation and trying to enlarge the gap with the other China. But how long and how effective can it be? Is the government replacing the other entrepreneurship? I don't know. I mean, if that's the other... Uh, best strategy. I understand it's inevitable, according to the other, uh, you know, uh, Bill's uh, presentation and the other uh, President Che's presentation. But is it the other right, you know, the other uh, kind of game the U.S. wants to play with China? So I, I think the other uh, that's one of the questions. And also, um, the other uh, U.S. is. Aiming for the uh, the ally showing or something like that, but because the uh, the domestic politics dominating all the economic incentives, so already you're getting a lot of discontents from the uh, the allies. For example, in the case of the uh, the in, uh, Inflation uh, Reduction Act, uh, like seven I mean seventy five hundred uh, dollars the uh, the tax credit for the uh, electric vehicles, but it was already there, right? It's not a new one since the, uh, the 2008 and nine, But now, the, uh, the <laughs> some of the foreign uh, electric vehicle producers can are deprived of this uh, tax credit because they are not, uh, you know, assemb assembled, you know, in, in the North, North America. So I think the, uh, the um, I'm not sure if that's the, uh, the, the right way of doing that. It's kind of violating the, uh, the international trade, uh, the rules-based the, uh, the market system. Is it a fair competition? I don't know. And the, uh, the level playing field. These are words that the, uh, the U.S. has been uh, advocating you know, for a long time. Um, and then um, I understand that the, uh, the there are some uh, link between the uh, production and technology. Uh, it's like the, uh, the industrial commons you know, the other uh, by the other uh, Gary Pisano. And it's, so I understand there's a downside of the globalization because the other, uh, all the companies and this, the other uh, global value chains are market driven, not the other uh, policy driven. And so the other uh, companies do not uh, consider the other, uh, you know, national security in terms of the other, uh, when they are making, uh, you know, decisions where they try to, you know, produce. Um, so there's going to be a leakage of the, the technology and also the, the uh, lost opportunities to accumulate uh, know-how and human capital from the, the manufacturing process. So it's sort of the, the sort of the, um, the learning by uh, producing effect. So I understand that there are some concerns on the, uh, the manufacturing, all the, you know, outside the United States, there are some fears and so on. Uh, and especially the, uh, the critical technology is very important for the, uh, the future um, of the, uh, the, you know, uh, the leadership. So um, the economic security and national security are on the line and uh, that's why the, uh, the there's uh, some uh, decoupling going on. Um, I think the, uh, the but should the, uh, the all this kind of the, uh, the policy uh, take the, uh, the whole package of the, uh, the you know all the activities like the, uh, the research development for type testing and so on sounds like the, uh, the you know uh, it's a way towards the, uh, the self sufficiency and the, uh, the if the U S China China is also using the, uh, the you know, the circulation policy, but the, uh, it's basically the, uh, the uh, taking the, uh, the inward-oriented the, uh, the policies. So um, my question is that the, uh, the, you know, trust is often emphasized uh, to restore the, uh, the confidence in the, uh, the international system and the multilateral system and the spirit of the, uh, the cooperation, which I mean, uh, which is also crucial element for the, uh, the a way forward. But 
I do not see these kind of the other things together. So, um, oh, I, I mean, the other, going back to the other professor, I mean, the president Chase choice question about standards, he didn't get a lot of votes. Why? Because I didn't vote either. Because he didn't give me the other, you know, choices that I wanted. Because, you know, there's not gonna be one. It's gonna be bifurcated standards. That's my answer. So I didn't have that answer, so I didn't vote, for example. So, I, my, you know, it, it, it's gonna be the, the, you know, so we are talking about the decoupling, but we all know that the, the full-blown decoupling is not even possible, even to the United States. How can U.S. ask the, the allies to do that? So I think um, the, the, the future is, uh, for some time, the, the bifurcated economy and the, the global supply chain is gonna be sort of the, the bifurcated, like in the other standards. Um, so uh, in order to the, the save some time, I, I'd like to just uh, um, the, the present a, a, a couple of the other questions. So what is the end game of the US-China strategy competition? Competitive co coexistence, is it a possible, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the end? And then if it's the, the bifurcated economy, you know, for some time. So markets are going to be segregated, and the other China. I mean, the President Choi mentioned that the other China, from the other world factory to the other world market, world consumer. But can China do this without the other reserve currency like the U.S. dollar? In, U.S. has been doing this the other, you know, the world market, as, you know, play the role of the other world market. But. I, I don't know. I mean, that's my uh, one of my questions. So, uh, seems like the other, you know, the one of the problems with the other, you know, China, you know, brought out brought out to the other the world economy was the other state capitalism, and coercive diplomacy. And may, maybe uh, it could change. So uh, my uh, last uh, comment is that. I think there should be a balance and a combination of international innovation policy, uh, industrial innovation policy and international cooperation. Uh, and maybe we need a new international institutions, maybe around the other like-minded countries who share common values, like democracy, maybe market system and so on. But it may be less universal than in the past so that Forcing, the, forcing China to make a decision to join or not, rather than cornering allies into the, uh, the choice dilemma. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Chung. Uh, very thoughtful comments and very tough question you raised. So shall we start with the uh, uh, giving chance to our speakers to uh, uh, quick response to the comments or question, then I open the floor and uh, collect uh, the question from audience. Okay, uh, first, who's gonna go first? <laughs> I mean, I can respond briefly. You know, Will the United States be able to pull this strategy off? I'm gonna answer like an economist. Time will tell, right? We'll see, right? Um, I, the challenges are intense and obviously US is overwhelmingly reliant on a free market system, both within the country and abroad. And it's not gonna shift away from that in very, very abrupt transitions. Uh, you know, I note, for example, that although the Trump administration imposed, you know, a whole series of tariffs on Chinese goods, um, you know, the U.S. trade deficit with China only expanded during the COVID period. Um, and the U.S. deficit in advanced technology goods moved from 130 billion in 2019 to about 195 billion uh, this past year. So. Have those policies had any significant effect? I mean, the data doesn't tell us that they have. So I think, you know, I think you're absolutely correct that there's gonna be a long transition period here as we attempt to, to adjust. Um, and frankly, um, there's time. And 
you know, I'd like to encourage, uh, you know, the scholars here and the experts here and uh, the experts in Korea to really think about what a strategic technology sovereignty ought to look like. Um, because I don't think the United States knows where it's headed. It's got some rough ideas. And as you pointed out, this is very much driven by domestic politics, which have been extremely disruptive in recent years. Uh, and with no real sign of immediate stability coming about, frankly, a very disruptive upcoming midterm election and another national election two years after that. Um, so that political divisiveness is gonna be with us for some time. And that is driven by this underlying social disruption that I talked about earlier, which is definitely pushing United States politicians towards, we could say, plain technology sovereignty in an autonomy kind of version. But it is so much in the US's long-term interest to move that into a strategic approach uh, in a collaborative way with other countries that I think eventually will arrive at that policy. But there's a very important role for Korea and for the EU and for other traditional collaborative uh, players with the US to help design that strategy. So I think your point uh, about the need for a new institutional look here is an important one. Yeah, perhaps I can follow. Well, thank you very much for your insightful, incisive comment. Uh, let me uh, present three uh, points. First of all, uh, I don't agree with what you're saying, the past globalization market driven. Well, that is a very uh, phenomenal aspect. So what I'm going to say is, uh, as past three decades of so-called hyper-globalization is uh, designed by US and West on board, and I think you know future phase of globalization. I'm, I'm not also you know agreeing with many people saying deglobalization, and we're going to see new phase globalization. It's not going to be solely designed by the US. Is going to be designed by with different mindset with the U.S. on one corners and China, and maybe uh, whether or not you know the middle power can be uh, on board that open-ended questions. It is mainly because when I was uh, coming to Geneva and Washington to negotiate telecom rule, I cannot forget how determined U.S. administrations to open up global financial market. And the flag of you know the free financial flow is good for the global society. You know the uh, U.S. administration was uh, leading that role, and also we all understand how you know the I should say uh, ruthless they were, taking advantage of 1997 Asian financial crisis to open up those financial sectors under the flagship of free flow financial capital is going to improve efficiency and furthermore, uh, get rid of corruptions and enhance global governance. Now, back in three decades, anyone who has verified, tested that tenant and that dogma has, you know, the sustainable. So, you know, I think what has uh, happening is uh, quite different. And now we are seeing a new phase of globalization, and that is, uh, the past globalization is uh, synonymous with one seamless you know, global value chain, maybe starting with the Silicon Valley and going through the Korea and the Europe and Taiwan and ending in China. And but new phase of globalization, we're going to witness some uh, two or three, some regional value chain in key sectors. That's what you're going to design, what you're going to create. So here we see the clash of will and uh, incentive between uh, politician and businessman, and also possibly we can play such a role in making sure this is not going to disrupt too much. So I think uh, too much mindless obsession with efficiency is not going to help him. As economist, I was always you know, feeling uh, how role economic is playing to make a world safe and better and prosperous society. Because in our own research room and classroom, 
somehow economists, we developed a you know, bad habit of emphasizing too much efficiency turn out to be static efficiency. And what is happening in reality is an ordinary person, they don't understand economic logic and they don't care about comparative you know, advantage, but they are always constantly aware at least one thing. If I stay alive, I should have my own comparative edge that may not be related to compare advantage, that may be related to absolute advantage. But as you know, the uh, Deputy Minister Jung mentioned, I should have something irreplaceable talent. So that irreplaceable is going to mean someone by irreplaceable by China, irreplaceable by America. This is the irreplaceable by AI, irreplaceable by robot. So there is a whole totally new world. Uh, there is something I can emphasize. And uh, second point is, uh, well, I run my uh, mock exercise asking open-ended questions. Suppose we have UN-like a system, one country, one voting, then which you know, standard you're going to uh, take a vote? Well, the exercise is very simple because I'm not going, uh, I was uh, telling loud, it is not decided by efficiency. It is not dis decided by market logic alone, politics. So the question is how U.S. and West were successful in really taking care of mindset of all those like-minded countries. That is an open-ended question. And that may be very few. That is not going to be majority. I can absolutely can tell you. Okay? Maybe Professor Son may have different view, but you know, it is not going to be majority. If you decide a majority, then you see a lot of absent voting. So that is related to third point. So while, you know, new Fragmented value chain is going to emerge. And also US is uh, showing by words and actions, you should take side, okay? You should invest in the USA. But very uh, reluctant to provide more generous incentive to like-minded country. Then here the question is, can it create coalition among uh, middle powers, such as can it have some you know, coalition among Korea, Japan, and European Union on the same boat? Is Brussels thinking that way? Is Tokyo thinking that way? I'm not quite sure. Based on my uh, months and you know, the uh, moments of dialogue with them, they don't think Korea is on their peer, even though we Koreans believe we are to the peers. And also I don't think Korean government is, uh, whether it is a right wing or left wing, they don't really believe we have to create coalition of middle powers and our uh, political landscape, economic landscape should stretch it to, to the east, to the Tokyo, to the west of Brussels. I don't think it, it is any place in the map. If you have different view, please then let me know. Thank you. Uh, as I said earlier, the uh, two-way the simultaneous interpretation available. So uh, uh, anyone we will have a question, you can speak Hangugo or Korean. If we want to prefer to speak French or Chinese, perhaps that will put the our interpreter in a big trouble. But uh, so, and also any participant in the online, also please send a text uh, email message to us. Uh, we're happy to uh, collect your uh, questions. Uh, okay, uh, any question from the floor? Yes. Yeah, good morning. Thank you for your insightful messages. Uh, my name is Hanak Cho. I'm from the uh, Ministry of Science and ICT. So my question is, uh, what will be the future of existing multinational uh, organizations? Uh, Dr. Chung has mentioned the possibility for a new uh, multinational organization to sort of facilitate uh, these processes and also um, Professor Bombillion also mentioned about the uh, so shift from the uh, inter, uh, industrial economic policy to industrial innovation policy, which might be uh, conflicting with uh, existing trade organizations and economic organizations like uh, WTO. And a lot of the um, companies and also international uh, global economies, com uh, countries has been abiding to the rules of trade rules such as WTO and subsidies and uh, countervailing measures and also to some some extent to a detrimental effect. Uh, there has been a lot of the uh, 
the tariffs and also uh, the fines that has been put on the companies. And this um, recent sort of um, um, availability of subsidies and uh, also abundant uh, the monies going into the companies as a, a sort of a supporting them and, and to the industries. Do you think this means sort of the free ticket to the companies and also the sort of the free pass for the governments to increase the subsidies, which might be uh, conflicting to the, uh, you know, the free market rules that has been ruling the global economies for a while? Thank you very much. Uh, related to the question, I also thinking about uh, when the uh, Director Bon Milian described the uh, U.S. Uh, industry in UN policy. That reminds me of what Chinese government have been doing <laughs> in the past decades. There was giving impression that there's some little convergence <laughs> between two great power in terms of innovation policy. So, wha what is the the uh, si similarity and the difference between two countries in terms of innovation policy, and what's the U.S. Uh, strengths, relative strengths, or compared to edge over Chinese? Yeah, 제가 사전에 어쨌든 그 지정 토론할 때는 영어로 하고 그 이렇게 토론할 때는 한국말로 하겠다고 말씀을 드려서 지금은 한국말로 어, 답을 하겠습니다. 그 사실 제가 그 토론할 때 말씀드렸던 그 New Institution은 꼭 국제 기구만을 의미하는 건 아니고요. 국제 기구도 있고 그 다음에 뭐 이런 새로운 어떤 제도 내지는 또 우리 그 최병일 그 총장님이 하셨던 무슨 어떤 그 프래그멘티드 그런 그 밸류 체인 뭐 이런 것들을 포함하는 어떤 어 그런 얘기였던 것 같고요. 사실 그저 동의하는 게 사실 막 보조금을 주고 이런 그런 인더스트리 팔라시에서의 뭐 텍스 크레딧이라는 이름으로 사실상 보조금을 주고 하는 것들이 어떻게 보면 그걸 그 오픈이 이제 완전히 그런 그 세상이 열린 게 아닌가 하는 부분이고 사실 이거는 당장은 예를 들면 그 미국 같은 경우도 이런 식으로 했을 때 bring back the jobs to the you know the the United States, but only for the time being. It's like the the racing to the bottom. 인 거잖아요, 그죠? 그래서 아무튼 아, 어 저는 아무튼 그런 부분에 대해서는 그래서 우리가 좀 깊게 생각을 해야 되는데 일단 그 coalition among middle powers. Doubtful. 저도 거기에 대해서는 별로지 않은데 왜냐하면 어, 한국이나 이런 미들 파워 국가들은 종속 변수라고 저는 생각을 합니다. 사실 얼마나 많은 그 policy space가 있을지 사실 우리 그 차관부님께서 오늘 또 이렇게 유난히 그 천천히 조심스럽게 이렇게 단어 선택을 하면서 말씀을 하시는데 원래 그 close door meeting 할 때는 굉장히 더 이렇게 오픈하게 하시는데 하여튼 좀. 그 이해는 하는데 아무튼 그 아까 말씀하셨던 그 안보에 필요한 기술을 누가 결정하냐? 아 우리는 물론 우리나라에서 우리가 결, 한국이 결정할 수 있죠. 다만 한국이 결정하는 거 말고 미국이 결정한 거에 대해서도 우리도 디펜던트하게 그 종속적으로 따라갈 수밖에 없는 우리가 겨, 그런, 그런 경제 구조를 갖고 있잖아요. 사실 우리가 셀프 서피션 할수 없는 이제 그런 부분을 우리가 생각을 해야 된다. 그래서 저는 아까 뭐 파티 말씀을 하실 때도 아, 아주 공감을 하는 거고. 앞으로도 물론 물론 계속적으로 미들 파워 뭐 라이크 마인드 컨트리들의 역할을 막 얘기하겠지만 실제로 크게 기대하기는 어렵다. 결국은 미국, 중국, 그다음에 EU 같은 경우 우리 우리가 이제 독일하고 다른 점 뭐예요? 독일은 EU라는 큰그 블록 안에 있지만 한국은 어디 있어요? 알셉? 이런 놈 알셉 그 do anything not really about that. Yeah. 아이 can add a point about the similarities between you know China and the US that you were making earlier. Um, US industrial innovation policy is aside from the historic defense role um, is really at the early stages. So I mean just to make one comparison with where um, where China is obviously China's focus has really been on applied technology development and manufacturing. Um, that has not been the U.S. focus. So, for example, in scale-up financing, um, you know, China has a system of some 60 industrial guidance funds. 
which are private sector led, they're equity investments driven by government suggestions about where, what advanced technologies need support. Uh, these 60 funds currently have approximately $1.6 trillion in authorized funding, of which about close to $1 trillion has been committed. Uh, the U.S. has no comparable scale-up mechanism, nothing close to those kinds of numbers. I mean, the CHIPS Act, which the United States considers an enormous commitment, is $52 billion, which frankly probably underestimates the level of commitment the U.S. is going to have to make if it really wants to build a significant additional fab capacity in the U.S., um, you know, given the level of support that other countries, including Korea, including Taiwan, have made to, you know, constructing fabs. So the U.S. is only starting to kind of dabble in this. A recent report from a U.S. think tank called CSIS has estimated that China's annual industrial subsidies to industrial scale-up are approximately 450 billion a year. So that contrasts with even the major commitment in the United States uh, to new energy technology implementation of, you know, hundred and uh, of, of, of you know several hundred billion dollars. So and that's a 10-year number. So the United States is not even in the game yet for the level of industrial subsidies that China is providing. So it's. There's a recognition in the United States that's allowed its applied side and it's allowed its connectedness to weaken, um, but that's going to be a gradual corrective process and it's going to emerge over time if indeed the existing commitments can be sustained. Can they be? Will these challenges alter? I don't think China's industrial policies are going to change anytime soon. Uh, those are fundamental to the growth of the state as planned. So that's going to be there long term. That technology challenge is going to be there long term. The national security aspects are only worsening. Uh, on the pandemic front, uh, you know, the United States public has been assuming, oh, we had an influenza epidemic in 1919. We had, you know, a coronavirus epidemic in, you know, 2019, 2020. We have another 100 years. But we don't. We now understand that infectious diseases are going to be a much more frequent occurrence given global connectedness, given global population increases. Um, you know, this is going to be a driver as well that's going to be pushing concerns about supply chains and technology advances and preparedness. Um, and then obviously climate change uh, is truly an international issue, and I think that's the right territory to really explore a better system of international collaboration on the technology development side. So these three challenges aren't going to go away. They'll continue to drive U.S. politics, but also politics elsewhere. Uh, and, you know, I think all of our economies are going to have to adjust to these things. Well, I think uh, U.S. policy is increasingly uh, similar to China's. Uh, unilateral and also very dogmatic and doesn't care economic uh, expertise view. But nonetheless, nonetheless, I think they're fundamental change. Fundamental change is one system is immune to criticism outside. For one system, I think it has at least for the time being, I say for the time being, capacity to self-correct. So it is uh, sensitive to public opinion, include academic society, what we are discussing, and at least they are showing attitude of listening carefully, and also the fierce uh, discussions, and free press and civil society. I think uh, that is, uh, uh, I think, you know, the very important demarcation point between one system versus another. But whether or not this, you know, demarcation point is going to survive 2020 for elections, I have less confidence. Sorry to say, but you know, my American friends will attest to what I'm saying. And responding to previous questions, I appreciate your questions. Uh, what is the future of existing uh, international organizations doomed? <laughs> well, uh, as far as WT is concerned, it is doomed, as we all know, because mainly two reasons: it is irre irrelevant. Because WTO, when I was negotiating for WTO 1990s, 
we are negotiating for the few trading rule, but one thing we uh, couldn't foresee was uh, dawning of digital era, and current trading rule has nothing to do with the digital uh, commerce, and what is happening is China and U.S. and European Union, all they try to bind to, you know, the create commanding side of digital trade. So if something, you know, WTO is uh, successful in creating the global trading rule and digital commerce, I think they could be relevant. But chance was given for several, several years, but they still, you know, showing very dismal performance. But more significant is, you know, despite the small fishes and the middle fish, they very concerned about WTO rule when it comes to anti-dumping subsidy. Big fish, they don't care. <laughs> anti-dumping and subsidy, they couldn't care less. So that means the WTO, it is impossible to adjudicate dispute because the adjudication system broken. But why I'm, I'm saying it is doomed when it comes to the future, but still some standard setting organization like uh, WIPO and ITU, I think they are standing, they are quite relevant. And then the important thing is delivery mechanism, WIPO and WTO, or standard setting organization. It is basically one country on board, and, and I, I think that is not related to, or I should say less related to market efficiency and market prevalence. So I think uh, still my exercise is relevant. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, more question or comments from the floor? Yes. Uh, yeah. 그 과학기술 정책 연구하는 기관에서 근무하고 있는 사람입니다. 어, 본 빌리언 어, 박사님께 에, 질문을 드리고 싶습니다. 그 앞에 설명하실 때 에, 그 미국 정부의 연구개발 예산에 대한 지원이 국방 분야와 이제 다른 분야로 구분이 되는데 에, 국방 분야는 상당히 이제 PRL 끝 단계까지 지원하는 데 반해 다른 분야는 이제 초기 단계를 지원한다고 말씀하셨습니다. 어, 제가 알기로는 그 미국의 정부의 R&D 예산이 상당히 국방 분야에 대한 비중이 굉장히 크고 거의 절반 가까이 어, 예, 지원하는 걸로 알고 있는데 정말 이 국방 분야의 예, 그 연구개발 지원이 정말 어, 국방과 안보와 예, 직접적으로 연관된 어, 그 분야에만 지원을 하는지 아니면은 좀 어, 그렇게 에, 스트릭트하게 에, 그 어, 말씀 판단하기보다는 조금 더좀 폭넓게 에, 굉장히 어, 그좀 간접적인 어떤 그런 그, 그 관련이 있는 그런 산업 분야까지 포함해서 상당히 이그 폐를 끝단까지 이런 산업 혁신 활동을 어, 할수 있도록 이렇게 지원을 하는 건지. 가 궁금합니다. 그거에 대해서 좀 답변을 듣고 싶습니다. 네, 좋습니다. 저도 한국말로 아, 이 질문이 어, 미국 우리 로스님 박사님에 대해서 다른 한국 패널한테 도움이 되는 어, 질문을 하나 하는데 아까 전에 최 박사님께서 그, 그 글로벌 서플라이 체인 그리고 여러 가지 테크놀로지 관련돼서 아메리카 리스크, 차이나 리스크를 이야기했는데 어, 두 우리 한국 어, 발표자님께 이걸 어, 이 리스크를 어떻게 매니지할 수 있는 구체적 방법에 대해서 조금 더 듣고 싶습니다. 물론 몇 가지 아이디어를 던졌지만 제가 좀 푸시해서 어, 이 리스크를 관리한 한국의 입장에서 어, 이 리스크를 하는 방법 가령 어, 해, 국제 공조 인터넷 코어프에서 저희가 만약에 미국 뭐 일반 이 다, 다자 체제 가령 어, ROK, EU, US 우리가 3자 트라일레터럴 스트레이지 다이얼로그를 한다든지 그러니까 트레이드 테크놀로지 카운스 만든다든지 ROK, 뭐 EU, US 사이언스 파트너십을 한다든지 뭐 이런 방법으로 해서 뭔가 리스크를 매니지할 수 있는 또 다른 게 있는지 좀 의견을 더 듣고 싶습니다. 제가 먼저 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 in response to your, to your good question, it's really all about the dimensions of the U.S. defense innovation system versus the non-defense innovation system. Um, you know, in fact, defense R&D is not the dominant player in the U.S. It once was, obviously during the Cold War it was, 
uh, but that, that has changed significantly. So just one example, defense research and development as opposed to later stage applied work towards systems is about $12 billion a year. That compares with just, you know, our largest R&D agency, which is the National Institutes of Health, that's close to $40 billion a year. So DOD's role in this system um, is not what it was 30 or 40 years ago. Now, the U.S. relied on this defense innovation system to launch a series of major innovation waves. It launched much of aviation advances. It, it launched much of space advances, obviously nuclear power, much of computing, the Internet. All these came out of the defense innovation system, but they were definitely related to very specific national security needs. So there was a spillover to the broader economy in many of these areas, particularly in computing and the Internet. Um, but in effect, a dual-use capability came about as a result of these. But they were focused on meeting national security needs. So will electric vehicles be a national security need? Unlikely. The Defense Department of the United States is not going to take that on. So this whole suite of climate-related technologies is going to fall into territories of other agencies in the U.S. The whole suite of pandemic and biohealth and pharmaceutical technologies is going to fall into other, other shoulders than the Defense Department. So just with these two things, much of the innovation system has really shifted away from a DOD focus. So that's why it's so significant that the U.S. non-defense sector is starting to adopt and move towards more applied technology pickup. Have they developed all the tools in areas like manufacturing, interagency, collaboration, technology scale up to be able to do this? Not yet. And that's my answer earlier. You know, we'll see if these agencies develop that capability in cooperation with the private sector. Final, final word, we have to ask you a little bit about risk management. The risk management is one of the most important systems in our national security system. But if you want to do it, you need to do it in a way 그 다양한 소통 채널들을 잘 유지하는 게 필요하다. 그러니까 우리가 그동안 구축해낸 FT 네트워크라든가 뭐 이런 하여튼 그 외에도. 근데 사실 그 제가 볼때 최병일 그 총장님께서 얘기하셨던 그 아메리카 리스크, 차이나 리스크. 저는 이렇게 봅니다. 그러니까 이게 중국으로부터 와의 경쟁에서 우리가 막 살아남아야 되는 부분들이 있잖아요. 그 근데 사실 우리가 국제 협력을 얘기하지만 미국 회사들하고의 경쟁도 훨씬 치열해질 가능성이 있다. 지금의 이런 미국의 그 인도셜 팔라스나 이런 것들을 보면 그래서 한국 기업이 결국은 미국 기업들과의 경쟁에서도 또 살아남는 방법을 찾아야 되지 않는가 저는 그런 생각을 합니다. 뭐, well, the question was not given to me, so I don't think I have to <웃음> respond to the question. Uh, but if I uh, try to make some contribution to the thought, I think, you know, uh, as we are open to say, the firewall between trade and security is long gone and uh, government will drive it. But that is opposing another risk because uh, bureaucrats, the technical bureaucrats like, you know, the uh, Mr. Zhang, uh, they have their own incentive system and also they have their own you know, way to you know, promote themselves. And what is happening is uh, to manage, I'm not going to use minimize risk, to manage this risk, uh, obviously a measure metal principle, it uh, prompt effective and sustainable and sustained discussion and dialogue between government and business sectors. But while I was negotiating early 1990s, I was always puzzled because Korean business never come to government to say I have this problem and that problem with particular government. Now, after you know, years and years of my uh, career, I realized why that's the case. Because business is afraid of uh, exposing their problem to the government because they're afraid that may be used against them. And this day, they are afraid they may be used against them on multiple purpose. So there is a, you know, the almost insurmountable barrier to make happen 
between candid dialogue between government and business. I do not know the case of Germany's made different story. Germany is very successful in creating some class. So I think, you know, unless something is happening in this, uh, what you're discussing is uh, long on talk, short in action. So which means we should come up with different, different mechanism. And so our thinking should be very hard. But I like to say, um, uh, concluding in, in my part, what is happening in US, China and tech hegemony competition, that is awakening to rethink important, significant manufacturing sectors. Look, while, while, while all this discussion says manufacturing is not important to uh, drive economy because contribution GDP is uh, a maximum 30%, 20%, maybe UK less than 10%. Uh, all advanced economies, they are uh, driven by service sectors and finance content. But I think you know, that uh, economic uh, indicate uh, sheer mindful uh, obsession with how much GDP, how much job you create by manufacturing sectors are going to miss very important realities. I think this is a rediscovery of significance of manufacturing. Thank you very much. We are already over on the show. We're out of time, so I have uh, thank you. Uh, I think it's a really good start. Uh, paved the way for the more uh, interesting and constructive discussion for afternoon session. So thank you very much to all the participants and audience. Bye.